Before we introduce you this week's guest, I like to read a review. This one is from Lani K. Asian Women of Power is a catalyst for healing and getting rid of stereotypes which Asian women continue to endure. Kim Chi and her guests candidly discuss thought-provoking challenges which Asian women and their families face which affects our self-esteem, dreams, aspirations, careers, family life, and more. Bravo Kim Chi for teaching us how to live life loud. You are inspiring. Thank you Lani K for your kind words. What I and other coaches found is that by speaking up and sharing what we experienced in life would help us heal our wounds. Please keep listening and sharing this podcast. We appreciate your support and review. And now I have a new tool that I want to share with you. Using your cell phone, text these four letters A W O P to the number 64600. Again, text A W O P to the number 64600. You will get a link to my virtual business card brought to you by Easy Card. With that link, you have access to all podcast episodes. You can search by the guest name, by their ethnicity, or by the keyword from the episode's title. Check it out. It's really cool. Now, let's get started. Christina Vo is an event curator, floral designer, and blogger based in San Francisco, California. Christina regularly hosts salons for women in her home that focus on addressing and bringing to light issues that women face today. Christina has worked for UNICEF and Soli Deredat in Hanoi, Vietnam, and the World Economic Forum in Geneva, Switzerland. She holds a master degree in social and public communication from the London School of Economics. She is about to embark on a journey, which she calls Tour de Forty. Let's find out. Please join me to welcome Christina Vo. Thank you. Hey, Christina, before you share with us about Tour de Forty, we want to know a little bit about you. What was your childhood like? My childhood, I, um, I actually moved around quite a bit. My parents um, came to the States from Vietnam in 1975 and 1976. Uh, my mother arrived. Um, they were both, they met in Saigon, at Saigon Medical School, so they were both um, doctors in Vietnam. Um, when they came to the States, only my father practiced. And we moved around a lot. Um, I was born in Connecticut and we moved to Utah for a year, Tennessee for about six years, Illinois for a year, and then Indiana where I spent um, junior high and high school. So my upbringing was very nomadic, I would say. Um, I think my father in retrospect was really longing for um, kind of a search for peace. I think, you know, after the trauma of leaving Vietnam, I think he, gravitated towards small places and really was just trying to create for us just a, a peaceful upbringing. He had a very deep longing for peace. And um, I see that now and I I recognize that and um, I also really appreciate it. At the same time, um, you know, I think moving around gave me um, some sort of resilience just to, and this ability to be in different um, environments and also, um, in places actually, unfortunately, where there weren't that many um, Asian people around. So in my um, in my high school class, I think there were only, um, in my graduating class, there were actually, I don't think there were any other Asian um, people except for myself in a class of 430, it was still small. But um, yeah, so it was, it was a nomadic upbringing, um, not very diverse, but I would say also still, um, quite beautiful in a way. 
That's very interesting. So you mentioned about your father. What about your mom? So your father won inner peace, but what about your mom? My mom. Um, so it was interesting because um, I think when she arrived in the states, I think her. I think uh, I think she suffered a little bit more. Well. I wouldn't say more, but she definitely suffered a lot of trauma. So I think when she arrived in the states, there was something that, what you know, she was fearful in a way. So she didn't she didn't practice medicine. She you know even didn't want to take English classes. But then there were people um, in a local church that encouraged her. She never learned to drive, um, so she was dependent on my father and also friends. But she was also incredibly creative and talented. Um, She she cooked a lot. She briefly opened a restaurant when we were in Connecticut. She taught me a lot just by observation about community because she because she didn't drive. She had to like, and my father was a surgeon. She had to like make connections and make friends with neighbors and and build this like network around her to help her, um, you know, get the things that she needed and also like help her get my sister and I around and. Um, She she nurtured life a lot. I, I think I learned a great deal by watching her. I mean, it was it was you know had I don't know probably had a sunroom that probably had 50 plants in it. She was also really good at um, decorating. She was just multi talented, um, but never really I think used those talents in the world, which I, I I think was is one of the reasons I've kind of created the life that I have for myself as. A contrast to, I think, how my mother lived, like very creatively, but creatively in the sense of only for her family unit and and friends around her. And she she also passed she passed away when I was a teenager. So um, a lot of my post teenage years and my twenties, there was a lot of reflection for me about being a woman and and this traditional non traditional, consciously and subconsciously. I think I've always been thinking about. How I wanted to be in the world as, as a Vietnamese American woman. So she, do you want to be like her, or you want to be a little bit opposite than what your mom um, show up? I think, um, I think I've I've aspired to be like her in, in the ways that she treated people and the ways that she built community, which is something that I'm, I'm currently doing, and also I think I have been good at in my life. But I think. Differently, in the sense that I really wanted to be able to, like, I I really had the strong desire for my creative pursuits to be expressed and my passions to be expressed in the world and visibly expressed through a business and through, you know, everything that I do. Really, whereas you know, as I said, I think for her it was more um, more about using those skills to nurture a family, and I I think that's why I've been more, you know, focused on doing that outwardly. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I I had the same the same aspiration as uh, as you uh, mm -hmm. from my mom. Yeah, she's like the role my role model. There's certain thing, there are many things that she did perfectly. She's like a, a nurturer. Yeah, you know, she's very good with people. She's really care for people. She's very generous. Uh, on the other hand, she. She was not very uh, vocalized, you know. She's like not staying up. But but you have to understand that you know we all of us came from Vietnam here, right? So that tradition is still carry on, right? So in inside the household, as as a woman, you don't speak up. Yeah. Right? You let most of the time you let the husband decide what's going on. But I'm. Uh, I didn't like that. <laughs> I tried so I tried for many decades, and I did not like it. And and that's why I create this show is to help other women to really vocalize about what they want, what they passionate about, and who they are really, and how they want to live life. Mm -hmm. So, who were your role models growing up? Um. You know, I mean, I think I, I think really growing up, it really was my parents, and I think I didn't realize that until until you know, actually, in the last like five years. I think 
I've been very fortunate that I'm kind of a mix between my mom and my dad. My uh, my father is also really inspiring to me. He he was he's a very quiet man, um, and for a long time it, it that took me. It was difficult for me to understand that, especially losing a mom as a teenager, and then um, you know just being left with my father, who wasn't a very vocal or expressive man. At the same time, like he has he is somebody who's really had this longing and desire to search. He was the first person who asked me a long time ago, many, many years ago, before meditation was trendy, if I'd ever meditated, because I think he was aware of, of the way that I have a lot of ideas and my mind, you know, can be very scattered. And he just, you know, one day we went for a walk and he said, oh, have you ever tried meditating? And, and I said, no. And he said, oh, it, it, you know, just try to start and just look at something simple like a rose and see if you can focus on it for a little bit. And, um, and I've just seen him go through so many transitions and continue to reinvent himself in his life. And he started writing about um, around the time that my mom passed away, so around um, 1994, and just with his own personal story. Um, and then he he writes a lot about the history of Vietnam. I mean, he loves Vietnam deeply. So he, I don't know, he's written at least 10 books and he does a lot with, um, with his, um, classmates from Saigon Medical School and and just you know he's so committed to the projects that he loves and he's so intellectually curious and even when I was a kid even though he didn't speak very much I remember um, he was not you know he was difficult to um, reach I think to emotionally connect with but um, he had this like little box of note cards in his office and it had all these like inspirational quotes and also like uh, medical terminology that I think he was studying, but, but he, and he, and still to this day above his desk, he has, you know, like 10 different quotes, you know, quotes about like living life. And he's always read self-help books and given us self-help books. And, and um, he, my father I really think taught me the value of searching for that deeper meaning for life. So I think this combination between my mom and my dad, my mom being very like community oriented, creative, um, and social kind of it, with the contrast of my father being very intellectual and curious and deep and reflective and spiritual, they really provided me sort of the, together this wonderful foundation of what it means to be human, I think. so. Wow, that's a wonderful combination. Yeah, they got, they got the best from both both <laughs> worlds. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I think I, I think I really. I mean, it took me a long time to realize that, but I think I really did. Um, I think they were a great. Um, I think they were, you know, a really wonderful match um, in terms of two kind of opposites coming together. Hmm. So, why did you decide to study and working abroad when you were in your twenties? Um, I remember, so when I graduated from college, I took a job at uh, my first job near where I went to school in Chapel Hill, North Carolina at a pharmaceutical company because I studied public health. And I just remember being in that little cubicle and, and thinking like, I, I just, I knew even then that I was very, I, I just didn't fit into this sort of corporate culture in the States. And I just had, I didn't, I didn't have, I didn't study abroad as a college student. So I still had that desire to go abroad. And so I actually just, you know, started contacting organizations in Hanoi, um, international development organizations. And, and um, that kind of started my journey, just um, doing an internship with UNDP in Hanoi and then going back to Vietnam to work for different nonprofits. And then it, it something, I don't know, opened me in my twenties where, I was just learning so much by being around, uh, being in a different country, being back, you know, being in Vietnam, number one, learning more deeply about Vietnamese culture, but then also being surrounded by expats. Um, and it, it just really opened my mind. I was kind of like, I would say like addicted to going back. Um, and that's why I continued to go back throughout, throughout my twenties. And then in my thirties, I, I, you know, have, has, I've mainly been in San Francisco um, for the last eight years. And actually, like now I'm, as I'm approaching 40, I think I'm coming back to like 
having that desire to travel again and, and but combining both the 20s and the 30s like you know stabil a little bit of stability but also exploration still um but i think in my 20s it was just a really i was just very curious and very interested in, in learning from from the world and i think it, it served me really well i think i being exposed to different perspectives has helped me realize like i don't have to live you know this sort of very traditional life. Although in my thirties, I think I, I flipped a little bit and there was, there were a lot of shoulds, like I should stay in one place. I should, you know, stay with one organization. And, and um, yeah, I, I think it was a good time, but I don't, I think my spirit is more um, nomadic. And I, I want to integrate that again um, in a smarter way in my, as I go into my forties. So you still have a, a route, you, you still consider Vietnam as your route, correct? Yes, 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 I do. Okay. Uh, yeah. What about your father is, um, you know, I know that, you know, they both escaped from Vietnam, correct? Yes. So have, have your mom has already passed, but has your dad um, complete forgiveness forgiven the uh, the communist party i i we actually don't uh, have this discussion i would venture to say no um he hasn't he has not been back to vietnam i would re i really wish that you know he would go before he passes away but i i don't think that yeah i don't think that he has um I think that is, uh, I'm trying to find the right word. I think that's, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, I, I, at the same time, like, I know that, you know, from what he's written, I, well, I mean, I can't, I know from what he's written, I don't know from experience of what that is like to, to see so, to see so much suffering because of war and to lose a country that I think he deeply, deeply, deeply loved. I don't think he could have written so many books about, Um, anything else because I mean I think that just to me shows like the depth of his love for Vietnam as he knew it so I think it's it's something that he yeah he hasn't forgiven um, I can't tell him what to do obviously like for me I, I would want that for him I would want that for anyone to kind of reconcile that part of your life and and to try to forgive but at the same time like I can't also speak for the tragedy And, and for the pain and, and uncertainty and um, everything that he observed and, and, you know, all the Vietnamese people of, of his generation, just growing up around war and then having to leave behind your country. I also had a brother who died. Uh, my father left first because he was stationed, um, he was part of the South uh, Vietnamese army. He was stationed in Phu Quoc actually by chance. So he could easily leave. And then my mom was still based in Saigon and, and I had a brother who got sick. and. So when my mom arrived in the States, like, you know, obviously without, without my brother. So my father, you know, lost a country, lost, you know, friends, colleagues. And, and then when my mom arrived, he lost, you know, he lost a son. And, and in some ways, I believe he also, I think my mom, something happened to my mom's spirit during that time. I think it was really hard for her both to lose a son, but to, to, to be there maybe. Yeah. I, I, I don't exactly know, obviously, because she passed away, but it's just what I feel and what I've sort of surmised from conversations and, and um, knowing a bit more about her, like how spirited she was when she was in Vietnam. And actually, she was born and raised in Cambodia and, and they went to, to Vietnam in the, yeah, in the late um, 60s. And, and so she actually had to leave too. Too. She's still of Vietnamese descent, but they were in Cambodia. Um, so for her, it was kind of leaving, you know, leaving Cambodia, then leaving Vietnam, then losing a son. And and I, I think to get out of Vietnam, I, I, I think it was very um, challenging for her, as it was for many people, and traumatic. So, um, yeah, I can't. I, I would going back to the original question. I would like to say, like, I would love for him to forgive. At the same time, like, I can't understand the. I, I don't have the depth of knowledge of or understanding of the pain yeah it's uh it's really hard if you don't experience it's, you don't understand <clears throat> the impact of yes. the, the experience right the trauma that it caused you 
So um, yeah, but if somehow, some way, your your dad feel or see that it's a part of life, right? It's uh, you know, w when you look at the history, <clears throat> one country at one time will evade the other country, right? And there will be some killing, there will be some taking all over the countries and things like that. So it happened in Vietnam. I'm one of the bold people, and my my family's um, my family's uh, properties uh, was taken away. Right, so most of my family, my, my siblings, and my family, my mom and dad, did not forgive Vietnam for a long time. The Vietnamese, you know, the communist Vietnamese, right? But I feel that I I was the first person to forgive and go because of what I have learned through coaching. Okay. That, that um, you know, you hang on to that resentment, that hatred. It does not help you. No. And if you you look into the world, really, it's, it's everywhere. There's there's a powerful uh, take over the weakness and things like that. So it's just life, right? And um, when I look at my um, Look at the past. Yeah. I have a lot of relatives because my father family <clears throat> came from the uh, come from the north. Mm -hmm. So he has some relationship with the North Vietnam, right? So they some of them they serve the the northern Vietnam government. So how do we deal with that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so for a long time, um, yeah, it's. Um, it's hard, but yeah. um, I came to a conclusion that it's part of life, and it's my relative, and they didn't, they didn't do it because they wanted to. They just follow a vision, you know, uh, uh, some something that they have to do what they need to do, right? Just, just like our American soldier, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes they, they come to some country because they want to serve America, but it doesn't mean that they want to kill other citizens. Mm -hmm. So just think of that way. Yeah, and I and, think another thing is that I think that that, you know, that that trauma it passes on through generate the trauma and the the pain it does pass to generations. And if it's in in some ways when things aren't healed or forgiven, it it carries on. Um, and I think that that yeah, I, I would look forward to having more sort of intergenerational dialogue um, about the war and about trauma. And and I want also like hope like you know of people of my father's generation to keep their stories alive, and keep that that history. Um, but to to have more of a dialogue between us because. I always have this vision of like my dad and I like writing something about like my Vietnam, your Vietnam, like, you know, the Vietnam that he knew and the Vietnam that I fell in love with. They're very different countries, but I think that there's still like there's still a spirit. There's still a, a heart and soul of whether you want to call it, you know, I, for my dad, it would, you know, be just South Vietnam. But for me, like I also fell in love with um, I also fell in love with with Hanoi and with North Vietnam. And, and I know that that's also something that's difficult for my father to, I think, fully understand. And um, I often think about that too. When I decided to first go to Vietnam, I really wanted to go to Hanoi because I'm very much about aesthetics. And I was so um, charmed when I saw these pictures of, of tree-lined streets and lakes throughout the city. And, and I think um, I, I think it probably hurt my father a lot when I said, oh, I'm, I'm gonna go to Vietnam, but I'm, I'm going to Hanoi. So that's, it. yeah. Yeah, it's. Um, I think it's important for you to learn and to find out about the um, the. I forgot what's the, what's the word you you use. I forgot what's the word that you just use. Um, the generation. Yeah, intergenerational. Intergeneration trauma. Right? Trauma. Pass on. Yes, uh, a lot of Japanese had that in them. Mm. Okay, so if you listen to um, some of my um, interview, I interview several Japanese American, 
they share that. And um, the most recent interview I had with Kirk, mm-hmm. um, he, he, oh my God, <laughs> Hiroshi, <laughs> something, I forgot his last name suddenly, but uh, Kirk uh, talked about um, intergenerational um, drama mm-hmm. from his um, grandfather. <clears throat> so what, uh, what is an event curator? Mm, I mean, I view it as someone, well, for me, at least what I love to do is it's not just about um, thinking about the sort of the the content of an event, but also the space and looking at events more like an experience. Um, For me, what I've done this year, it's primarily, as I said, like, like building on this idea of salons and, and, and cultivating an experience at home actually. And the reason why I've chosen to do things at home is because I think it, it drops um, into a deeper level of intimacy when you arrive. So for example, if you have like 20 women who are coming here for an event, most of them, if given enough time, you, they'll at least talk to probably half of them. But if you go to an event space, for example, or like a yoga studio or, or you know something else, you would probably only talk to five or even two or three. Um, so I, yeah, I have been, you know, I've always been doing sort of like the visual side of events, mainly through floral design. And, and, um, but I also really like content. Um, and I, and I'm, I like to find speakers. Like I think I naturally just, you know, connect with different people and can see what their skill sets are. So if I meet an interesting person, I often want to shape, um, shape an experience around you know what they particularly bring to the world and and it just ha- you know has happened like pretty organically for me and i think the curation also involves um who's invited um i think you know what i've done this year is i started with these women's groups and then i realized there needed to be a way to kind of continue the dialogue so i just you know i created a facebook group it doesn't have many people but you know a couple hundred not all in the bay area some and and i i write pretty regularly in that facebook group as a way to sort of maintain the connection it's it's still pretty one way i I do share and want other people to share but um i think people might feel that it's just like my platform but also sort of the curation of the event is also about the people who are coming because I think a, a lot most of the people who come to events at my place they're already interested in another layer of depth of conversation right they're not interested in just going and mingling like they really want to connect and really want to deeply share so you know for me curation is is sort of the whole experience from the people who are invited to the speaker to the way things are set up I actually did a men's group in June and I um And I, you know, bought, I had some food catered, but then I made some of it. And it was, it ended up being 20 people, 18 men and two women. And they were really impressed that, that I had, you know, home cooked food for them. So I think that is also an added layer of, um, of making something special, like making people feel, you know, they, they are going to something that is unique and, even the food allows um, a layer of conversation. So I think for, you know, and I don't act like it takes a lot of work, but if I have an event at home, I'm basically, or if I'm planning for uh, doing florals for a wedding, it's usually for the week before I don't, I don't socialize at all. I only, I'm not working on the event the whole time, but I'm I'm thinking about it. So um, there's a lot of thought that actually even for the smaller events, especially that really goes into uh, making these, events unique and special and, and about connection and um, community, really. What was the most memorable salons that you have? Um, there have been a few this year. Um, oh, well, I mean, I, actually, I would say that the most memorable was not, um, it wasn't, it was still an event at home, but it was actually, it was actually um, the death anniversary of my mom this year. It was the 25th anniversary. And, and you know, I have a lot of Vietnamese American friends and one, one um, friend, he, I met him in, in, in Saigon the first time that I went there in 2003. Um, and he's just become like 
almost like a brother to me. And he said, he said to me last year, you know, we've never honored your mom on her, on her. And I also, with my dad, we never did, we never did the traditional ceremony. And so he said, let's, let's do this. So last year was the 24th anniversary of her death. And we, um, we hosted a small event and this year was a 25th and we wanted to sort of, um, adjust it a bit. So, cause because we don't actually know like the traditional <laughs> way to do this. So we're just like, we're just going to modify. And so, um, so I hired a sound healer. Um, so there was music at the beginning of it. I went to, I didn't cook the food, but I did go to San Jose and um, buy a lot of delicious Vietnamese food. So we had, you know, an entire spread. So basically, you know, people would be filled up by a meal. And then, um, and we also invited what, we, what I thought was interesting was that, you know, we had the altar, but we didn't just, it wasn't, I kind of um, sent the invite as if it was both my mom and I hosting. So it was an invitation from me, but also from her acknowledging and inviting, um, you know, deceased loved ones of the people who were attending. So we had them bring images as well to put on the altar. And uh, yes, it was, it was really beautiful. And, and with the, in the combination with the sound healer, um, it, it, we just, it was just a really magical, I mean, I felt that I felt the energy, I felt the presence of, of my mother, of these other spirits, actually for days, for days, the, this, this living room that I'm sitting in is where we, we had um, the ceremony. It, I, the whole day after, so the event took place on a Saturday night. Um, the, the following Sunday, I didn't leave this room. I could still feel, I could still feel that there was this, this, this presence of, of ancestors and, and people who had passed on. I, and I didn't want to leave the room. It felt like this safe, beautiful cocoon. And we, we, you know, we kept like, we kept offering um, our ancestors food. So even as we were eating the following day, we kept bringing food to the altar. And um, yeah, so that was a very special, very, 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 very special event for me this year. And it, it, it I don't, I mean, I've always felt my mom's presence, but this year in particular, um, I felt it more. And especially with some things that have happened um, with my family, I just, I felt that, yeah, she's really been with me this year in particular. That's a great idea. A great, great idea to have a sound healer yes. there. Basically to basically to heal the the disease, right? The spirit, as well as the the people who are coming. Yes. It's yeah. wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, we had we had children there too, and because we we thought about that, we didn't know. It. People asked if they could bring their kids, and and then we decided yes, like that. We wanted to we wanted them to witness this tradition and, and still be a part of it, even though parts of it were you know there were there were there you know there was prayer involved, so there were parts that that see, and I actually um, you know there was a song that really reminded me of my mom. I didn't sing it with, I sang it with the music, but it just, um, there were, it was just a, such a, it was such a special, it was a really special event for me. Um, and it's something that I would love to also in my work help other people do. So that kind of goes to what I want to do is just help, help people make events more meaningful. And, and that's, that's going to be very specific for each person, but for any kind of event that, that can be done. And, and, even like when I think about like sort of reframing like weddings, you know, and traditional ceremonies, just making them fit with um, the people who we're celebrating. And also, you know, for example, you know, because my 40th birthday is coming up, but also to to do ceremonies for yourself, because um, as someone who, you know, is single at 40, I think like why if I had the unlimited like financial constraints, I would throw like a ceremony for myself, like something not as elaborate as a wedding, but something as beautiful, kind of like a, a recommitment to myself as I move to this other stage, to this, you know, midlife period. So um, I think we need to reshape how we honor and how we celebrate and how we look at life and, and important moments and also, um, how we look at death in a way. Wow, that's wonderful. I think that's um, that's a very unique, unique idea. 
and you I, I think you have something there it's it's very special very unique a, a, a different twist about memorial day yeah right <laughs> i think you are heading to the gold mine there <laughs> <laughs> so now let's talk about tour the 40 why now um so a few things happened. I mean, I didn't think much about um, really about turning 40 until, you know, sometimes I would be in conversation with friends who have either just turned 40 or it's coming up. And, and there was just such kind of dread that came with it. Like, oh, like we're entering midlife and like, like all these things are just like, this is, this is midlife or this is what there was sort of a negative, um, feeling around it and um and we're all in different you know everybody's in a different place when they turn 40 and and you know have worked for you know different things some people have been like much more traditional and they've been on a very traditional like career path and and some people are you know just starting to like raise families but for me um i am single at the moment i don't have a family um and last year, I guess I started to realize, wow, like my, my social life is, is changing a lot because yeah, like a lot of my, my friends are in relationships or married or have small children. Um, and they don't have as much time. So I actually started actively asking friends like, Oh, can you introduce me to like, in particular, specifically other women who are around my age and maybe in a similar situation. And that actually was one of the reasons why these women's groups started because I just started to see this need for, and not just, it wasn't just for women my age, but I just started to see this need for women to convene. I think that there's always that need and desire for that for both men and women, but sort of selfishly, I started doing this for myself because I realized like, I, you know, my, I'm going to, you know, continue like everyone's lives, they're going to continue to change. And because I'm not kind of moving along with this like more traditional path, it's a little bit more difficult to socialize when, there are lots of little kids involved and maybe I don't want to be around lots of little kids on the weekend. So I need to find more, um, female friends around my age. And, um, and then I guess like what started to happen recently, which is why I kind of wanted to do this whole, like, you know, sharing more writing around turning 40 and like re reflecting on, on where I am right now is that I started to realize that, you know, based on all the decisions we've made, you know, we've created, some sort of life for ourselves, right? And it might not be the same as what that looks like for other people. But whatever that is, I realize you just have to learn to like, always, you know, try to improve your situation, always try to like, you know, make things better or like have goals that you're trying to achieve, but also to have an acceptance and appreciation of the life that you do have. And I think for my particular case, it, it means um, I'm blessed with freedom, freedom in the sense that I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, you can look at these things as, as a, a good or bad thing. Okay. So I don't own a piece of property in the Bay area. I rent and I'm still sharing this. It's a lovely apartment. I'm, you know, sharing it with people, but I'm not, I'm not stuck to San Francisco. Right. So I can, I can still travel. I can still move. I can, I have that flexibility in my life. And also because I don't have a family and I don't have a partner right now, um, I also, I still have that flexibility. So my idea was like, I need to embrace that, embrace what I feel is kind of the, was always my true essence that I a little bit moved away from in my thirties because I, I tried to, to go down this like should path and it actually didn't quite, you know, it's, it, it was never meant for me. So anytime I was sort of deeply entrenched in that, it, it just didn't feel right. So I wanted to really take these few months, my birthday's at the end of October, to, to explore that and to reconnect with people in different, from different parts of my life, to reconnect with myself and to reflect on um, what it means to turn 40, you know? And um, so far, I mean, there have already been some, some bumps, but it's just so far I see that um, it's, it's, it's gonna be a really beautiful process. And I think um, ultimately I'd love to help people sort of claim their lives in a way, you know, not claim somebody else's life, but claim your life. So whatever you, whatever you've been given, whatever you've created, like just to, to really take ownership of that and to, and, and again, like I said, like adjust where, th where things need to be adjusted, but to, to not feel bad on about anything that you've done in your twenties or thirties that lead you to where you are in your forties and don't regret 
moving forward in, into midlife, I actually have always appreciated every year of getting older. I'm, I think I'm fortunate to be an Asian woman because I don't necessarily think I, I might not look like I'm 40, but um, in terms of wisdom and um, awareness of oneself, it's just, it's a blessing. So you mentioned about you are facing some bumps toward, uh, you know, before you heading the tour. Yes. What, uh, what are the bumps? Um, so recently, um, you know, I think we always get, I think life, or the way that I look at life is that there are always tests. Like we're always tested, right? Tested to see if we really want what we say we want as one example, but also just, um, I think continued tests of our strength and determination in a way. Recently for me, actually, I, uh, my sister had, uh, was hospitalized and she was, um, she was put in a, she's only a few years older than me. She was put in a medically induced coma and it was really, um, I mean, obviously very traumatic for her, but also for me and for, I, um, I have claimed independence. And as a result, a lot of times I've been away from my dad and my sister. Um, and I haven't really, you know, I don't keep in great contact with them. I think some of my friends always say like, it actually feels sometimes like you don't, you don't have a family, you know, it's just you and your friends. And um, I spend most of my holidays with, you know, friends in the Bay area. So I think, this just happened um, actually a few weeks ago. So I think what that was, was that, and I think my mom had had a role to do with that. Um, it, it was a bump in the sense of really like reflecting on the family that I was born into. Something that I, I not that I didn't want to accept, but I, I think I felt guilt around for leaving. Number one, leaving um, right after I graduated, um, from high school and going to college in North Carolina and then really never coming back and never really playing an active role in the, in the lives of my dad and my sister in my twenties because I was abroad and, you know, because they were struggling with things. And, and I think in a, in a very self independence can also be perceived as selfish and there is a selfish component to that. Um, I think I was only able in some ways to take care of myself. I don't think I had that full strength to, you know, deal with what I needed to deal with, but then also be there for them. And I think this recent experience with my sister um, really tested that because um, I'm actually writing an essay about this. It really made me see myself. It, it almost felt, it, it felt oddly familiar to when my mom was in the hospital and I was 14, my sister was 16, except my sister was in the hospital now, but yet I was still a daughter, a sister. And now like an added component was like, I was the out of town, um, aunt who, and, and my niece and my nephew are, you know, a year 15 and 17. So just a year off from, from how old my, my sister and I, and, and, and just to see them, it, it, and then a wise friend said to me, it was, it was kind of like a life review, like not only like review, like, you know, this review in the sense of that I think typically probably happens as you're at the end of your life, when you're reflecting on your relationships, I think I, I'm very lucky in that in a similar way. I think my sister's very lucky in that she got, she really um, kind of got the second chance, but I think all of us as a family unit, got the second chance of, of understanding each other and seeing how we deal with pain and, and, and suffering. And I mean, I, I saw my dad and, I, and then even myself, my own responses and then my sister. And it just, um, it was a really beautiful healing moment, but it was also a little bit jarring. So, I mean, I just got back last week and last week I was, I was, it was pretty off trying to settle back into San Francisco um, but uh, yeah, that, that was the big bump because I wasn't kind of expecting to, to really deeply look at that, um, dyna family dynamic. Yeah. I like the, um, I like the phrase that your friend said, it's, it's a live review for yeah. you and 
it's fortunate that you have a chance to experience it now, right? Rather than much, much later when when it's too late yeah. to, to connect the relationship with your uh, sister, right? So, um, yeah, congratulations. Yeah, I mean, because I think, I think um, you know, I think we're born into a family for a certain reason. Like, I, that's just my belief. Like, we're born into this unit because we have specific lessons for each other and you can learn them or you can not learn them. And I think I've been avoiding them for a long time and just dealing with that. But I actually think that that's kind of, it's foundational for how you, and a, a reflection of how you just interact with the broader world. So I'm, I'm really grateful as well. And I already feel closer to my sister and, and a deeper understanding also of my father. So I feel quite blessed. So is the is the tour the 40s still on? Yes. So um, it's gonna. I'm gonna. I'm modifying a bit. I'm, I'm still planning to leave San Francisco. Um, I haven't decided on. I was more. I really like wanted to set up, have everything sort of set up. But now I'm kind of more fluid about it because I've decided also to. Um, build the build a, the event component of my business so i'm also open to trying to get projects and and also exploring you know short-term projects abroad to help curate more meaningful events so right now it's just kind of an open period so i'm kind of looking at it like still an expiration of these months before 40 but also it has a bigger scope now i mean i still plan to start at my dad's um at the end of august and go to north carolina where i went to college and and visit some cities in the south and also doing an essay series that's actually going to be um, posted on Diacritics, which is a, a you know it's a Vietnamese um, blog for artists of the diaspora, and so it's just going to be you know a series of six essays reflecting on forty. So so it's it's shifted a little bit. It's still happening. Um, I'm very much somebody that's now back in the mode of how I used to operate in my twenties, which is like I'm just going to kind of go with the flow, and and kind of create things along the way, and then as I go to these different cities, hopefully I'm able to create some sort of, do some sort of event with women. And it might just be, it's not gonna be as organized as I thought it would be, but more, you know, impromptu. Maybe it's just like, oh, I'm in town, let's have a party and let's talk. And, and, um, and you know, already this, what happened with my sister brought me back to Indiana, a place that I don't go back to often. And that also en enabled me, you know, I didn't connect with many people from my childhood, but a few. and. That was also really beautiful and something that I didn't want to share because it's being from Indiana, however you want to call it, is not something that I necessarily like advertise. You know, it's it's a town of thirteen thousand people in southern Indiana, and um, but it was it was really, you know, I had some wonderful people around me, and it was really beautiful to be able to reconnect with them. And I think that is also all of this is part of um, the foundational work of going into. 40, um, reconciling, you know, childhood, 20s, 30s, and then just, I, I think this next phase of my life is, is going to be the best phase. I mean, it already feels like that's happening, but right now I'm doing a lot of, I'm building the foundation for that. And, and again, like I said, I think there are also little tests and even, even in terms of relationships and interactions with men. And, you know, sometimes I think I've overcome certain dynamics and then they show up again and and I do believe that until you until you really learn that lesson you're going to get the same lesson and it comes in a different form it comes you know it looks like a different person but it's the same dynamic so that has also happened to me recently where I'm, I'm really trying to ingrain this understanding of of um of myself and you know self-worth and self-love and um and you know this really stay true to the framework of what i'd want to seek in a partnership and i and i do want to have that i don't want to perpetually be single um so it's not and it's not necessarily a goal of mine but um it's just where i am right now but um yeah those tests have also been apparent and and also you know it always comes up it's like oh and i think you know, and just to be really honest, it's like sometimes it does come up. It's like, oh, what if I met somebody in the Bay Area two weeks before I was supposed to leave and, and fall in love and then I don't want to go? And 
and there, there's always a little bit of, or I, you know, I don't want to travel because I don't, you know, I'll miss opportunities of being with this person or something's just started. So, so that has also come up for me, like, and, and that's been a, that's always been a struggle for me as a woman. I'm not going to say that that hasn't, that this desire to be with a man and the way that that pulls for, you know, and shifts and, and adjusts plans and, um, even at even at 39, almost 40, I'm still grappling with that, and I'm okay with it. <laughs> yeah. So, almost 40, and Mary and Charles. Yes. Is this this is your choice, right? To be single with no attachment. I mean, I don't think it was a. I don't think it. It's not that it was planned. I mean, I think I think for um, a large part of my life um actually so i i have a very wonderful spiritual friend who 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 has a really deep understanding of and he sees people very clearly and he says to me that um he thinks my you know my portal to really reflecting on life and really reflecting on myself is through relationships and particularly relationships with men this you know, this, these dynamics that I have and these challenges that I try to overcome and, and stemming back to actually my, you know, primary relationship with my father. Um, because I love to talk about love. I love to talk about relationships. I love to think about them. But it, in my, when I look at sort of my trajectory of relationships, I mean, I, I started being in relationships, pretty, you know, pretty serious relationships, like in high school and, and, you know, had one in college as well. And like, but I would go in and out of like serious, like, serious relationship for a few years to periods of being single and then serious relationship. And then, you know, a few periods of being single. And I think for the last, um, my last relation, long-term relationship ended three years ago. And, and for two of those three years, I actually did not want to be in a relationship. I think I was, I was somewhat involved with people, but not people who were actually available either. They lived in, and, and that, you know, shows that I actually didn't really want to be in a relationship. I wanted to, to be, loosely connected and um on some level intimate with people but either you know they were i was not fully emotionally available they were not fully emotionally available they some of them weren't even based in the bay area so you know if if i'm really honest with myself i the truth is i didn't actually really want to be in a partnership you know and i think that that's that's one thing that that um we have to be honest with ourselves about I'm moving into a phase where that's different. This year I've um, dated a lot more than I have in the past few years. And that's been a really wonderful um, learning and growing opportunity as I think it always is. Um, and I definitely foresee in the next year or two, like a deeper partnership. Um, but I, I see that partnership as something that's, and the word that comes to me is expansive and spacious, something that um, really is about two independent people, you know, merging and, and seeing each other, recognizing each other and giving one another space for continued growth as individuals, but also um, a sense of, you know, shared intimacy. So, um, yeah, I think, I think when, I think oftentimes, people my age who are single or and who haven't been married and divorced, for example, like I think, I think people who are divorced kind of get a little bit more credit because at least then in their minds are like, oh, but the, at least they like committed enough to get married. Whereas people in my situation, I think are often judged as if we're not capable of being in a relationship, which I think is a huge misconception because I think it actually, I think if you find, you know, a single person who's older who has done a lot of the reflection who has taken the time to go to therapy and do the self-work and understand your own obstacles um there's a beautiful you know Rumi quote about that it's it's um you know it's something to along the lines of your task is not to seek love but to to uncover all the barriers within yourself to to receiving that love and for me that's what my journey has been about so i I do believe I'm fully capable of being in a good relationship. I do believe that I want to, and I think I'd be a great partner. Um, yeah, and I and I'm almost there. You know, I still think I want to do some things on my own for you know for at least the rest of the year. But um, I think 
single people in their late 30s, early 40s, or even beyond, like shouldn't actually be overlooked. But I think I, I would hope that they have done. I, I think all people should do this continued work of of how to be a good partner. And I think you learn how to be a good partner, not just in relation to a romantic relationship. I think we as a society, as you know, just undervalue like how much growth you can do from all kinds of relationships. I mean, one of my best friend, um, who I mentioned before, like we've been friends since 19, you know, since 2003, and we've had so many, so many obstacles and times when we haven't connected and we've learned so much about one another, both about what we need in a relationship, how we communicate. And, you know, we've never, we're just friends, but we can learn so much from every relationship. It doesn't have to just be, you know, a marriage or a monogamous partnership. So I think, you know, I hope people like broaden their, use every relationship as an opportunity to learn and become better. What is a good partnership for you? I mean, I think I mentioned it a little bit before. I think um, I, I think it's for me. It would be a balance. It would be a balance of of independence and intimacy, of of closeness and distance. Because I I believe like there's there's still so much that I well, first of all, I fundamentally believe that you nothing you cannot get all your needs met by one person. And I don't think that you should want to. I'm not just talking about, I'm not talking about like, I'm not going into like the, the physical intimacy component because that that's a whole negotiation that, you know, couples should do on their own. And I I prefer monogamous relationships, but um, in terms of, um, for me, like emotional connections and just and just um, different things that I need from relationships, I I don't think, I don't expect my partner to satisfy all those needs. I have so many friends that um, really stimulate me in different ways that I would never like want seek a partner that that is going to be all of that. And I, I know that he couldn't be right. But I, for me, I would just want somebody who is kind and respectful and and um, I fundamentally, I think, wants to still grow as an individual and as a couple. So whatever that means to us as a couple, um, that would be something shared. And I do believe there also needs to be some sort of shared to keep a couple together, whether that's, you know, you, the creation of your family unit mm -hmm. or something shared in terms of some sort of vision. Um, I think that that to me is what will hold me in a partnership that I, I would love to be working towards something with somebody. So what's your next step after Tour de 40? I don't know. I mean, a part of me, um, a part of me really longs to, to, the outside of the Bay Area. Um, outside of the Bay Area? So yeah, yeah. Or at least, I, you know, I, I don't actually know what's going to happen. Like, so I, I feel like in the fall when I when I travel, when I visit with people, like, I don't know, I might get captivated by, by a smaller space and, and want to move there. I might want to continue to be somewhat nomadic. I would, you know, I'm going to continue to build, again, like the event side of the business, not just floral. And so I would love those projects to be um, not just in the Bay Area, but you know, throughout the country, and then even internationally. Again, I'd love to work on some international projects, and then in the future, future maybe in the next um, year or you know however long. Like I'd love to to write more about about these topics, um, and so hopefully a book about about you know unconventional forty or you know stories of women turning forty and and. I would love to work on on that kind of project, um, and as well this year, I'm also taking um, I'm doing an online coaching program. So that's something that I, you know, I feel like will add value and will help me um, help other women who are at a similar turning point. So I think that um, sort of the writing about forty, my forties, and um, this coaching will take shape. You know, in addition to sort of the events that I'm doing. But I see that more as like a two year, you know, sort of a two year window. I think, you know, the next two years will still be about meaningful events and slowly building this this coaching and, and slowly writing on this on the side because, you know, writing, it takes a lot of time. So um, that's kind of 
the career trajectory or the business trajectory, but in terms of place, like I'm open. And again, like I would really like to, to add love into this picture at that point. Um, and yeah, also, I mean, we didn't touch on it much, but you know, also it wasn't like related to like having children. I, I never really, there was a moment in my late twenties that I thought, oh, I should freeze my eggs. Um, and then that moment kind of passed. And then in my thirties, it never really, um, it, I, you know, I was in a relationship and the person I was in a relationship with, he didn't, he didn't want to have kids. And I kind of was like on the fence. And then, um, I didn't want to become one of these, I didn't want to be this person that, that started, you know, at 35, like desperately, like seeking a partner because I needed to have kids within, you know, this last window of time. Like, I didn't want to do that to myself and I didn't want to go into a relationship with that in mind. So it just, it, it sort of between 35 and 40, it just, I kind of put it on a back burner and then it, um, it hasn't really reemerged. And now as like I enter 40, I'm like, actually like, I wouldn't, I don't want to have, I don't really want to care for like small children. I love the idea of, um, you know, having kids in my life, I, I'm so open to the idea of like dating someone who already has kids and, and is divorced. Uh, I think I would be a great stepmom. Um, and I think that there's so many ways to to be to have kids. I love kids, um, and I think I'm good with them. I there are so many ways to have children in your life, um, and also like my niece and my nephew, sort of developing a closer relationship with them, and and. Um, Another theme that I'd love to write about is that there, there are like, there's so many ways that we can be maternal. I think with, the, with like, for example, the community of women that I am curating, like I feel very maternal there. I, I often, people, people often um, comment to me that I, I am very maternal and I do feel very maternal. And I, I love that because it's like, you don't have to, and sometimes it's a negative connotation. So sometimes men, who I date say like, oh, it's like you have this like maternal vibe that I don't know if I can like, <laughs> I don't know if I can understand or do. so I'm, I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud to like that people still consider me maternal and I don't have my own children. So I think, I, you know, I also want people to like kind of reflect on that, that it, it being maternal is not just about like bearing a child. And I'm sure it's a beautiful, wonderful experience. And I, I know like from friends who have had children that yes, I can imagine that, you know, there's, it's not much can compare to that love that you would feel for your own child. Um, at the same time, like, you know, there are many ways to, to be loving in the world and to feel that love and connection and opting to not do that through by having your own children, I think is a, is a valid and, um, you know, worthy choice doesn't make us like second class citizens because we're women who, who don't have children. Hmm. That's a wonderful uh, insight uh, that you share. And thank you for thank you for saying that. I think a lot of um, <clears throat> women at your age, like 30, 30, mm -hmm. 30, mid 30 to 40s. Yeah, that is one of the concern about being single is they feel that their obligation is to produce the next generation, right? And then they rush into um, a relationship so that they can bear a child yeah. to make them feel complete as a woman. But I don't think that is the right reason, right? <clears throat> so what are the top three major insights that you have learned from 40 years of your life? Hmm. I think, um, I think that it all for me revolves around voice. I mean, I am very much a storyteller. I like to st tell stories. I like to share. So I think if I concisely sort of thought about like the three points, it, it would all be around both like kind of, for women to like find your find your unique voice, um, know it, um, understand it, learn how to express it, and then use it. So really, I mean, I guess it's all kind of around one topic. It's just really about is about knowing yourself and being able to share that 
person with the world, whatever that looks like. I think when I was younger, and I still remember these stories of people telling me like, your per you know, your personality is too strong. And I remember like a, a teacher actually in high school told me like, oh, so-and-so, this guy was joking that he didn't want to go out with you because he thought you would talk about something academic and was scared to go out with you. And then even I remember being in some, like former jobs and also like one time in San Francisco, just like men saying to me like, oh, well, you know, you should be like a little bit like less, um, opinionated or you should have less your personality is too strong and and men don't like that and you know what i would say what i would want women to do is just you know don't okay i don't want i'm not saying like you should be like incredibly vocal and rude to people like there's a level of consideration we need to have and and an understanding of context and environment and what's appropriate and i think grace is really important for women but i think that that doesn't mean you can't speak your voice. And and still, like only recently have I really, really started to learn this in all situations. Like that you can say what you mean in a very kind way. And, you know, I don't believe in blaming people. So I mean, I may do think that you should always, you know, take it from where you're coming from and what you want to express it's, and not make it about the other person's fault. But if you, if you need space, if you, can't you know do x y and z for all the people that are pulling at you because as women i think we tend to get pulled and we want to do everything and we want to multitask but it's just to to own your voice to know your voice to know what that means in different circumstances and to to, to stay true to that and also to really invest time in like finding what your true passions are and your true passions don't have to necessarily support you financially but to to know what you're offering in the world. And that could be your children. You know, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with your life's mission and vision to be raising a beautiful family. I still think that that's a worthwhile endeavor, but for some people that's not going to be the case. And if it's not like, you know, find what that is. And, sh and we're all meant to shine. We're all meant to share whatever it is, you know, that we're particularly passionate about or knowledgeable about. And so, so I would just really want, you know, both men and women to find that and to, to offer that. And then at least in my case, it's like, and then that's kind of where, when you find true satisfaction, that's what's I think happened for me. Like I know what I love to do. And when I'm doing that, I feel totally aligned with, with myself and connected to the, to the world around me. So I hope for people to, to try that at least. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for that, those insights. So how do you want people to reach out to you? Um, email. Um, I'd love for women who are involved to, um, or, you know, watching this I, to join my private Facebook group. And I guess I could somehow share that with you and, and, and they could join. I think that that's, um, I'm okay. particularly interested yeah. in connecting with. Um, you can share right now. Oh, um, but I, no. Yeah, I can. I. It's just um, so the group is called Conscious Style, but it's all one word and just one S. So that sometimes confuses people. So it's C O N S C I O U S T Y L E. So there's a public Facebook group and then there's a private Facebook group for women, and that's really kind of the best way that I want to connect with women. And I share um, a lot of personal stories. Um, in my in my private group. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here at the Asian Women of Power podcast. We wish you all the best in your next journey in the next decades. Now for you, if you want to get the latest update from my podcast, or about my events, text a w o p to the number 64600. Until next time, live life loud. Bye now.